Um, hi, I'm Professor Samantha Caetano from the Department of Statistical Sciences and today along with Rohan Alexander, who is also a professor in the department, we are going to be starting a series of interviews with experts whose job it is to actually conduct and analyze surveys. The hope is that they can share some of their ex uh, experience and perspectives to give you guys a better idea of what it's actually like um, on the ground running these kind of experiments. Yeah, so our expert today is an old friend, uh, Dr. Jill Shepard. Jill is a lecturer at the School of Politics and International Relations at the Australian National University in Canberra, which is also where I study. She's an expert on political behaviour, Australian and comparative politics, uh, internet politics, e-participation, but most relevantly for today's interview, uh, surveys and quantitative methodology. So just focusing on that, um, she, um, she has a lot of research interests in terms of sampling, uh, population-based surveys, questionnaire designs, recruiting respondents. So all of these sorts of things that we just sort of take as given and never really think about, but are actually like the actual bread and butter of actually doing surveys and really affect the statistics that you can do down the line. Australia had a election in 2019 and like a lot of elections the polls were you know there's various opinions but the, the, the polls were neither here nor there and so Jill was one of the reviewers of the polls and she's also uh, been an investigator on the Australian election study which has been run for what 20 or 30 years now um, or okay. associated with there you go yeah uh, associated with every federal election. This is a series of, of, of polls that occur in the lead up and also immediately after uh, this, uh, the federal elections. And so, so we're gonna talk about all of that and more. And so thank you very much for your time, Jill, and welcome at least virtually to the University of Toronto. So exciting to be in Canada. <laughs> virtually. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I wonder if we could start with a little bit about your background, Jill, and how you kind of became to be one of these people, AES. What exactly did you do your PhD in? Okay, so I uh, did my PhD in political behaviour in Australia, basically looking at um, determinants of political participation and how much the internet is, um, I guess, expanding opportunities for participation. Um, I'm not a stats person, so I know that's probably like really disappointing to a whole class of, of stats students. Uh, I'm not at all. I learnt on the go in my PhD. And when I look back now, my stats in my PhD are embarrassing. I, I running OLS for things that were not normally distributed and, you know, violating so many assumptions. Um, but I learnt a lot, you know, and we sort of... I don't know you kind of find your feet I think after your PhD and you actually kind of learn yeah. how things happen so well, that's, yeah that's kind of the point of a PhD right you just you learn to adapt right and so it's as much as anything an exercise in project management like yeah. any big research project is like yeah your stats have to be good and you have to have all this sort of domain knowledge but it it's as much as anything, it's about just finishing the bloody thing, right? So yeah, and um, learning like how to learn, right? As right, well. right, because it's just a big unwieldy thing that you have to yeah. kind of wrangle. Um, so my supervisor has run the Australian election study since. Um, and apologies to the students because my dogs <laughs> are going. Through. Um, what are their What are their names? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Come, Esri, come on. No, no, they're not going to perform. Sam, maybe you can do, um, you can do dog comparisons. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'll bring my laptop upstairs like later and show you guys. My dogs are way too big. <laughs> my students in Australia are so used to seeing my dogs. No, you can see one little point. Anyway, they, they're they very just want the treat. <laughs> they, <laughs> they're some of the dumbest dogs in the world. Okay. Um, so my, my PhD supervisor was, um, has run the external election study since 1987. Um, oh. And we got along very well. This is such an unimpressive story. We get along very well and he's getting old and he kind of needed an, a succession plan. And that's how I came to be working <laughs> on the Australian election study. Cool. Um, I, I really enjoy the 
um, the kind of social and personal elements of sampling. You know, if thinking about in a good survey design, um, the ways that we can get people to respond accurately, the way that we can help people with the process. I think that surveys are like a favor that we ask of respondents. And yeah, so totally. I, I'm really invested in making the process easy for respondents, making them enjoy it and kind of not asking people. Um, like I think if we're asking people for the time to respond to a survey, then we have to give them something back. For sure. Mm. Yeah, that's and being nice respectful of. Straight up. Yeah. Cash, yeah. But I, I kind of, yeah, I think there's a, that there's a sort of a compact that we have with survey respondents. Um, and, and so I see survey management, survey sampling and all these things very much as project management. So um, a little bit more on survey like methodology, what exactly is the AES? So what exactly is the Australian election study and why is it so important? question Sam so after every, election, we, after every federal election because we're a federal system like Canada uh, we survey <clears throat> usually around 2,000 respondents um, asking them how they voted the things that went into their vote choice how they feel about politics and the political system in Australia uh, how they feel about different candidates and different issues and the idea is basically well I guess it's twofold one is that we have an academic interest in understanding why people vote the way they do. Um, but one real advantage of the Australian election study is that we haven't changed a lot of the measures over 30 years. So we have this now incredible time series that can show us serious trends in Australian politics. And, and Australia, like a lot of countries, is having this kind of democratic deficit. Um, and so we see it. We see, you know, between 2007 and 2019 in Australia, so 2007, we just had a had a, the end of a long-standing government, the election of a, a sort of young, you know, he was 50 odd, um, popular leader, and and things were good, right? Things were at a high. People felt good about the system, and then we see over the subsequent 12 years like drops in 20 percentage points in things like trust in politicians, in satisfaction with democracy, in the feeling that politicians know what ordinary people care about. Um, so again, a lot of the, the really good, I think the really kind of important things that we get out of these big, like these big longitudinal studies, um, sure they can lend themselves to really sort of intricate stats and analysis, but Sometimes those top line figures are uh, what gets the most attention, and I kind of I find it, I kind of find that fun. Yeah, you know, for sure. sometimes all you need are just descriptive stats. I mean, yeah, you're preaching to the choir. <laughs> oh, that's so cool. I think just, we, we, this is about telling stories, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> Jill was paid to uh, to use that. Is this what you? No, that's that's the title of the of the course notes: telling stories. It is. It absolutely is. If I, I can collect the most complicated, um, experimentally designed data, I can. I could run the most expensive survey. And this is the other thing: these surveys are expensive, right? So, yeah. it's such an exercise in trust to be running these surveys. I think I shouldn't be trusted with anything that is, you know, costing several hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, so there is this kind of as much as we're trying to innovate and do exciting things, we're trying not to stuff it up, you know? Mm. And so when we think about how do we tell the story, like how do we collect data that helps us to tell this story about Australia, then that kind of focuses, um, I think it focuses uh, our, our view of what we want, what we want it to be. Mm. And so one of the ways that we see these days to try and deal with some of those costs is to move towards probability, non-probability sampling, um, and with the comparison being probability sampling. Uh, could you talk a little bit about where the AES finds itself, if this is a spectrum, um, you know, where does it, where does it sit? It, this is a really tough question. And it's or even your understanding of it, right? Because um, it's such a and loaded it's, term. It's become such a loaded term these days. It is, and it's, and it, and it's such a kind of... <sighs> 
yeah, it's such a kind of loaded question as much as it's a statistical question. Because when you've got response rates of 30%, then is any sample probability based really, right? Yeah. So we work very much on the basis that the, um, the best thing we can do is ensure that we have a really strong sampling frame, right? It all kind of generates from the sampling frame. Come here, dogs. Um, if, we, if we have a list, and this is the other really kind of unsexy thing about surveys and stats, right, is that it comes down to the list of names that you have mm. to, you know, to, to provide coverage of your population. So, I'm so sorry. Um, We're getting good value for money, right? Two sources <laughs> of value. And so if, you can, if you've got a really good list of people in your country or in your population, whatever where you're trying to sample, then you're like 90% of the way there, mm. right? So something we struggle with in Australia is, is getting a list that, um, that provides some kind of probability-based coverage of the population. And all that means is that everyone in your population has an equal or roughly equal opportunity to be sampled. Uh, we used to use the electoral roll, which, the elect uh, which our electoral commission would give us, um, and that was great. Our electoral commission about 10 years ago uh, had a, and this is like, it seems so minor now in the context of things. Um, they had a bit of a mishap where they lost one ballot box in mm. Western Australia, which is a state, a, a big state in Australia. Uh, so they just reran that election. It was like, you know, nothing really mattered out of it. But as a mm. result, our electoral commission became incredibly risk averse. And, um, and now they're really reluctant to do things like give people their electoral role. Um, mm. So all of a sudden we're faced with this problem that we don't have a list of everyone in the population. And again, before I did my PhD and, and started learning about surveys, I was like, that must exist, right? So mm. we, we, all, we all fill out the census. Somewhere mm. there must be just, you know, a million page A4 kind of PDF with, um, with everyone in Australia or everyone in Canada. And it doesn't exist, right? Like it just, no one has that so what we use now to try to ensure probability based sampling is um, a list of every registered address in the country hmm. okay. so the post office basically has a list of addresses hmm. no names attached but here are all the places people could feasibly live mm -hmm. and what we find with that is that it's great it's got total coverage of the population anyone who lives in australia can, can reasonably be sampled this way on this list. It also has too many addresses, right? It's got businesses, it's got places that no one's lived in 30 years. It's got all of these sort of other problems. Mm. But if we're looking at under coverage of the population versus over coverage, we, we try to be conservative about this. So, and one thing that um, I guess has really motivated the Australian election study is tradition and stability. Right, there's a lot of ways that we could have innovated that we haven't. So we've stuck very strongly to probability-based sampling. We were very reluctant to do things like paying respondents um, because as our ethics committee says in Australia, uh, that might encourage people to respond who wouldn't otherwise respond. And we're like, yeah, <laughs> <a point>. um, <laughs> so we were pretty late to the whole kind of incentivizing respondents thing. Um, we have uh, traditionally done mail back surveys. So um, sending out a letter and with a hard copy questionnaire, getting people to send it back. Now what we do is what's called push to web. So we, and this is to save money. Um, so we send respondents like sampled respondents a letter and we say, hey, we'd really like you to, uh, to complete this survey. It's very important for democracy. You keep talking about democracy, like we just, you know, democracy is in crisis and it's really important that you uh, fill out this survey because we'll save democracy, right? Um, <laughs> but if you could do it online, that would be wonderful. And so we send people a, a unique um, URL with a password. And most people now are happy to respond like that. Mm. Um, there's always holdouts. Like there's about 30% of the sample who say, who, who say, no, I'll wait until you send us a hard copy questionnaire. Wow. Um, and that's okay. I mean, it ups our costs, um, like data entry and things like that. But yeah, we've, 
we get a lot of criticism for not innovating enough. And I always say that the decision to not innovate is, is, has been really important as well. Mm. So when you guys send out these, um, like URLs, are you guys sampling or are you just sending it out to everyone? Like, do you guys use cluster sampling? Do you use stratified sampling, systematic? We, uh, we, we stratify on the basis of state. Okay. So when we generate the original sample, if we don't have, um, we're, we're very much like Canada in, in that, you know, where you have big provinces and little provinces population wise, we're very similar. Um, so we could reasonably sample in Australia and end up with clusters in Sydney and Melbourne, and that's not mm. what we want. Right. Um, so we stratify on the basis of state and rural and urban. We can't stratify on anything else because we don't have um, information up front right. and we don't do any screening. So we don't say, you know, there's no kind of, are you, are you male or female? And if you're female, we've got too many respondents. Right. So we end up having to wait um, not massively heavily, but we, we have to wait pretty heavily. Um, we, we get the usual overrepresentation of, and this always sounds like such an offensive stereotype, but of old women, right? Mm -hmm. Old women love to fill in surveys and young men are a nightmare. <laughs> sure not just in surveys. Right? <laughs> <laughs> a life lesson. A life lesson. We always have that problem, but that's not... Um, like, God, we're not the only ones, right? And so but if then, I yeah, took... Oh, that question of sort of probability and non-probability based sampling, like at, at what point is it... At what point is that still a probability based sample? Yeah, and this is where people get so upset about it, right? But at, at, at a certain point, it's, it's just shades of grey uh, between, between what we're doing. Um, I think there's something qualitatively different between being asked to to complete a survey that you get in the mail and that and this is maybe snobbishness on my part you know but ha that has a university logo and that sounds semi-official I think there's something qualitatively different about that and about opting in to be on like a panel of you know paid survey respondents yeah. but, but that run anything that is paid and like not versus not paid and you've you've seen a difference in terms of responsiveness or i guess the groups of people that are responding we go so we we started incentivizing with money um in 2019 so as i say we're pretty late to the party we give a uh, five dollar non-contingent response so uh non-contingent incentive so if you just open the envelope that we send, you get a $5 gift card to a supermarket, um, which is pretty weak, really. <laughs> um, if you <clears throat> do respond in full, we send you out a $10 gift card. Um, we will go into experiment and see if it, you know, see if it has the differential effects on um, response rates and on, you know, mm. and sort of demographics of respondents. Uh, and again, the decision not to was kind of to look after the, you know, the the virtue, I guess, of the sample. You know, we were protecting the the time series as much as anything, right? Anytime sure. we experiment with this, we run the risk of, of causing yeah. a big break in that time series. Um, and, and we get a lot of criticism for this, a lot of criticism. Like, why, why aren't you trying new things? Because the cost is sort of unknowable, the cost of, of stuffing up that 30 year time series. Mm -hmm. So as a survey methodologist, you know, it's not always the most fun survey to work on. We don't get to do cool things, <coughs> but we, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a big project that I think is important for Australia. Yeah, fair mm. enough. It's, it, it, I, you could argue both sides about the incentives. So I could see. It's, it's really tough. And one problem that we have on selling this, you know, to one thing that we always have to do as academics now increasingly is to show that we have public policy impact, right? <clears throat> and we figure we can't reasonably go to politicians or to government or even to media and say, here's our survey. It has 15% response rate. Um, you should take it seriously. <clears throat> 
Now, we see the way that media covers opinion polls, right, in Australia or Canada or the US, and it probably doesn't matter. They probably don't actually care about the response rate. But we've got it into our head that unless we have about 30% response rate, the survey doesn't feel very valid. Yeah. Why 30%? I don't know. You know, we could have woken up and said 25%. We could have said 40%. Yeah. But That's like the whole p-value larger than 0.05. It, it's totally <laughs> right. So yeah. We draw a line in the sand and we've decided that for us it's about 30%. And if we can stay on the positive side of that, then we're doing okay. Mm-hmm got about 40 percent for the last election study and we were thrilled like nice so with 40 percent of the population i'm assuming you guys are collecting demographics demographic information as well as whatever is on your survey so do you guys have uh do you guys have to anonymize your data like what do you do for privacy of this uh people I mean, filling it out? everything most data are identifiable You know, Mm -hmm. people are getting really good at this. And um, with the amount of information that we collect, and we we go down to postcode. So when you've got postcode, um, is that zip code for you guys? Postal Postal code. code. Yeah, so very close. Yeah. And um, age, gender, occupation, um, Mm. you know. You get get unique pretty quickly, don't you? You get very unique. And so how much do we worry about it? Not as much as we should, like genuinely. We concatenate some of the data for public release so we don't release postcode. Um, some of the categories we blow out a little bit, but we still we still release date of birth, uh, not date of birth, sorry, year of birth. Um, you know, a lot of household information that could easily be identifiable. Mm-hmm. Yeah, even if you just linked it with another data set, you'd probably be able to to see who it is. But I didn't say that. Pretty quickly. I know. Well, this is, I know. It feels like we're releasing secrets. But it's going to become more and more of a problem. Mm. And it's something that stat students, like if this is the kind of stuff that stat students are are interested in, um, it's going to be, well, there's opportunities sort of for crime. but there's also opportunities to, to be a kind of data verification person, right? Like yeah. to be someone who works in what we call statistical disclosure, statistical disclosure limitation, right? So at what point, at what point does the needle shift from being identifiable to not identifiable? Mm-hmm. We've also introduced a panel element, right? So we've um, surveyed people in 2016 and come back and surveyed them again in 2019. That was there a differential a... response between those those people that you followed up with? Like, there must have been a higher response rate to the follow-ups. Uh, oh, yeah, absolutely. High response rate. So once people say that they're happy to be recontacted, they, right. they tend to mean it, right? Like, they people don't... This is another sort of big stereotype. People don't lie so much, I hope. Otherwise, the whole business is bullshit. Otherwise, right? we're, we're all out of a job here. <laughs> um, no people who... People who said that they would be happy to be recontacted, they responded at about 75%. Oh, wow. Right. Okay. Which was incredible. We were, we were genuinely surprised. Um, but they are different, you know. We can, we can gloss over some of the demographics and say, oh, we can wait. You know, we can wait these panel respondents. Um, they might be, you know, uh, disproportionately older or disproportionately female. And we can say, oh, we can... We can wait to adjust for those benchmarks, but we don't, we can't wait on the basis that they're just a little bit odd, Mm -hmm. you know? And that's one thing that, that's one thing that really worries me about non-probability samples is that um, it's something odd about someone who sees an ad to become a survey respondent on Facebook or somewhere and clicks through. Mm. And it might be that they, want to do it for the money. It might be that they're bored. It might be that they're just interested, but there's something cognitively about those people that we can't observe. And, and so that's... in contrast, the AA, AAS, um, you have these addresses and you just send letters to the addresses. Yeah. And our respondents are totally normal. <laughs> <laughs> they're not the same population. <laughs> they're, 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 they're abnormal in different ways. No, fair enough. 
I don't know how they're abnormal. I mean, they're, they're more interested in politics, right? Yeah. Yeah. And then people who, like I've just said, you know, when you get a letter in, in the post from a university and it's talking about democracy, of course you'd respond. Right. But that's part of me. Like, I'm not normal, you know? Yeah. I, would that. <laughs> I always think about my sister who's like a fitness trainer, right? Would she respond? Hell no. Yeah, fair enough. Um, so once you guys collect all this data, yeah. you have to analyze it. So what is like a common analysis and what are common, I guess, mistakes that people make when analyzing this data? Oh, that's a great question. Okay. So, um, the thing that the first thing we do and the thing that gets the most attention. So after we've put all this effort into sampling and all of these things, people go nuts for just these top line figures, right? What's happened to trust in democracy? What's happened to satisfaction with the leaders? Um, and so the, the thing that gets kind of, the, the thing that we put probably the most effort into is just a bunch of time series line charts um, that we can make in Excel, right? So I think, why, why do I bother with all of my stats and, you know, coding for hours in R when this is the stuff that people actually care about? Um, we archive our data straight away. So we make it publicly available straight away. It gets, it gets used for quite a bit of sort of academic analysis, but um, never as much as we'd like. We, you know, we're always pushing. Australia doesn't have a strong um, sort of tradition of, of quantitative political science research. So we're trying to kind of build that up always, you know, over 30 years. Um, people tend to look at mostly just determinants of voting. Um, why do people vote Labor, which is our, which, you know, your Labor Party, and why do people vote uh, Liberal, which is your Conservatives, right? That's right, yeah. Um, I'm really wary of a lot of this stuff. I think that people love to justify after the fact why they, why they voted for different parties and, and not that they're lying, but that, you know, we justify a lot of things to ourselves. We know, we know for reasons of political science research that most people just vote either how their parents voted or the party they identify with and it becomes part of their kind of social identity. <clears throat> There's a very small number of voters who are genuinely shifting their vote from election to election based on issues. Mm -hmm. um, so we try to kind of identify those people in the sample, but it's hard because they're, they're so small and we're running a population based sample. Um, people look at a lot of gender based differences are kind of the, you know, the sexiest things at the moment. And we have a really good sample for that. And, and again, the time series really helps because mm. we can look at how things have changed over time. Um, we had a female prime minister in 2010 and all of a sudden you saw a lot of gender gaps, um, just uh, obliterated like um, all of a sudden women were more were as interested in politics as men women were as knowledgeable about politics as men all of these things just totally shifted um and again the kind of i mean these data are deeply observational right there, there's nothing experimental about this there's nothing that is trying to look at um at causal relationships it's it's like fundamentally descriptive mm. in terms of things that people uh, like mistakes that people make i mean that's one of the big ones right is how do we extract causal relationships from observational data um the trick in academia as you guys know is just to say um you know gender predicts vote outcome it doesn't you know it's not causing it doesn't determine um, yeah but we use the we use this language so much that doesn't make much sense anymore right? Mm. What does it mean to say that age predicts, um, when we say that age predicts attitudes towards abortion, where we're, we're, you know, we're implying that it's a causal relationship, right? We're, we're like, we're very, very strongly inferring, we're getting all the way up to saying that it's causing, you know, that when you get older, you get more conservative, say. Um, but we can't yeah. say that with observation. You've done everything data. apart from say the word, right? Yeah, right? Essentially. Or, or, just, or we've done, we've done it in every possible way. 
and we've accepted as a kind of discipline that this is okay. It's, it's not really, yeah. right? It's not Particularly really Because okay. the implication of somebody reading the newspaper or whatever is, is what we are not saying. Um, it is that, that, that causal. You know, my mum or dad read the paper and, and they take it as, well, that's causal. There's mm -hmm. usually, and, there, and there's always some unobserved mechanism, right? One, a, a big problem with, survey, well, there's a bunch of problems with survey research. Uh, one, is that, well, one is that we think that the things that we observe are all the things, right? That, um, that we've always asked about opinions of the leaders and opinions on these issues, you know, these 10 issues that we've decided as survey researchers are the most important. But there's like innumerable other things that could be causing vote choice that we've just never thought of. Right, so it's the, the admitted variable problem. <coughs> Sorry. Yeah, it's impossible to exhaust the list. Right? You don't so know. So one problem that we've had with political participation says that, and this is now sort of classic in political science, is that everyone got very worried about young people. Like, oh, young people, they're mm -hmm. tuning out. All they do is watch TV and play Xbox. Like, um, they don't care about politics anymore. Because the, we weren't asking questions the questions we were, we were asking were measuring political participation as it was in the 1970s or the 1980s, right? We weren't asking about um, little things like sharing information on Twitter or, um, you know, buying ethic, you know, like consuming mm. ethic, like the little kind of what we were yeah, It was, do you, do you take part in a club or a, do you go bowling or whatever? Um, Right. Yeah, it was right. it's the, the Robert Putnam kind of, oh, no, we're not, you know, we're, we're not all in civic groups anymore. Um, yeah. and, and it's important to keep those questions because that's how you see a thing, like a phenomenon, like, mm. disappear, right? But at the same time it's disappearing, we don't always know what's replacing it. Right. And that's and always a problem. I mean, there's, yeah, there's heaps of problems, right? But that's a big one. So it seems like listening to you, it sounds like what you would be recommending and the most powerful methodologies and things would be just deeply knowing your data, like doing an awful lot of work looking at the survey and, and coming to know these respondents and what, what we're not asking rather than perhaps um, particularly exciting methodologies or something, you're really, you're really arguing to just drill down at the data. Would that be right? Or is there some other methodology that you're excited about? I don't know. <laughs> now, I don't know if I say, if this is my position because I'm just not a very good stats head, right? I, like, I don't know how much I'm, I just run down my stats and confidence, I guess. Um, but no, I think, it's, I think it's always really important to think about what, what's going through people's head when they answer the survey, right? Mm -hmm. Now, we can't know that, but we can get pretty close. And so things like physical questionnaire design, when you go to survey methods conferences, particularly when uh, a lot of them have sort of half academia, half practitioner, mm. which is really different, right? Most of the conferences we go to, it's just sort of pointy heads in bad fitting suits. But survey conferences are great because they have people who are actually doing this for a living. And the things that they worry about are so different to the things that we worry about as academics. Mm. They talk about, they talk about incentives. They talk about envelope design. They talk about, um, you know, if you're running something on your phone, how does it scroll down and, and sideways? And, you know, if you're trying to ask 10 questions in a grid and each question has five response options, what does how, it look like? Yeah. What does it look like? Right. Can I, am I going to misplace my big fat thumb and answer the, you know, give the wrong answer? Mm. Like, this is the stuff that is so boring to most people. And I find it so interesting and it's so important, right? Like it's, it's, it gets back to what I said originally, I think about if we're going to get people to respond to our surveys, we need to make it as easy on them as possible. And you can't get past or like, it doesn't matter how good your stats are afterwards. If your data are crap, because you, you know, because you've made it hard to respond, then it doesn't matter. 
right? All the post hoc strat in the world can only get you so far. Yeah, a student in Andrew my- Gelman, you know, waited yeah. the Xbox data and all this, but that's fine if you have an existing benchmark, right? And this is the kind of fun stuff that we can muck around with. But if I'm going into a field where I have no pre-existing benchmark, where I just want to find out, you know, sort of a blue sky, like no one's gone in there and found out this before, and I just want to go find something out, then I can't stratify for that after the fact, Mm. right? It needs to be good data from the start. And also it's so rare. I mean, we're talking a lot about political surveys just because that's where your expertise is. Um, But it's so rare that we actually get a result, right? Like for, if we're doing consumer surveys, we, do we actually ever know how many people like Mars bars? We, we never know. Right. Uh, It's so interesting that with political, with politics, we actually get a result. So so it does become one of the only few areas. And that gets interesting, right? Because we're, we, we assume with surveys that we're getting at some truth. So we can get very kind of philosophical about, well, what does that mean? Like, mm. uh, and something that keeps coming up with this um, opinion polling um, inquiry that I'm on at the moment in Australia is, well, what are polls trying to tell us, right? Mm. And pollsters, like people who work at polling companies say, we're not trying to tell, we're not trying to predict the election, right? We're telling you if an election was held today, here's how people would vote. But that's so much bullshit, right? Like, <laughs> that's how I read polls, but and that's how you guys probably read polls, right? Because we're trained in this, but 98% of the population thinks it's predicting the election. Mm. And it's so disingenuous for us to say... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, dogs have been mental again. They're it's outraged so as well. It's <laughs> disingenuous for us to say... Um, Oi, come here. Um, for us to say... It's not prediction. Yeah. Everyone reading it is, sorry, is using it as prediction. Stop it. (laughs) Uh, So just while we're, um, so I will put some various links to all of these things that we've been talking about um, along the notes. And we will be using the AES in a moment. So uh, so we'll send it. Yeah. Oh. Um, I so think of all the election studies, I think we have the best um, um, documentation. And because it's very, it's it sounds very thorough. Videos. Yeah. Do you guys have a team of people? So I'm assuming you have people who do like the analyses and then people who do collecting the survey. And if so, do you guys like work together or um, what advice would you guys give each other? So what would you want the survey people to know? What would you want the analyses? people to know. Okay, so we have a we have a field work company, like a survey like administration company that we've worked with for years. And so they and we trust each other like really heavily and that really helps, right? Um they that they're very strong on methodology. So if we were anyone if we were any other client they would be advising us strongly but they know that we don't listen. So, um, so we sort of go to them. Um, we just want, we ask for transparency, a lot of updates. Um, it's a terrifying feeling when surveys go out into the field mm. and it's like letting your baby, it's like your, yeah. your kids at school. It's you the scariest what? day that when you hit, uh, scariest moment when you hit the button to send it out. Oh. Publish, right? It's the worst. Yeah. <laughs> What's going to happen? I just sent out a survey. Oh, I sent out a survey to Australian political scientists uh, wanting opinions on every prime minister for the last 30 years. And I just forgot a prime minister. Like there's always some cock up, you know, there's always something that you've forgotten. Mm. Um, and so having a really good field work agency is really important then because you just have this confidence that if something stuffs up, they're the, this is awful, but they're the ones who were up till midnight fixing it. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> right? I mean, we pay a lot of money for this. It's not like I realize it's an indulgence on our part, right? Um, yeah. The Canadian election study, for instance, doesn't, isn't very well funded at the moment. And so they're going mostly online. Um, 
basically a non-probability sample, but they're going to balance that, I think, with some phone surveys as well to sort of be able to stratify their sample, or, you know, post-stratify um, post the online sample. And they're doing a lot of this themselves. So they have a big team of academics, um, which creates other problems, right? The, mm. the really lovely thing about us in Australia is that we have a clear hierarchy in our team like there is like a senior professor basically and me um his wife helps sometimes too she's another professor um it's a bit insular and we we are not always open to new ideas and that has probably helped in a lot of ways because we um because we have kept the kind of you know fidelity of that time series but on the other hand, you know, when I talk about things that, that surveys miss, we've probably missed things all the time, right? There's probably been phenomena in Australia that we just haven't picked up on, mm. that it's just totally past the AES by. Um, we have been slow to update our, our language on different things. Um, we didn't know at what point we should change, for instance, from Aboriginal to Indigenous, just little mm. things like this. Mm -hmm. um, and so a team, if, yeah. and so a more diverse team would have helped with that, absolutely, with things like that. Um, we asked about same-sex marriage when it became a political issue, but not before. Um, just sort of a lot of things like that. You know, the, the you kind of need, it's really hard to trade off between, first of all, with the money, you know, how much can you outsource the the crappy admin to someone else um, and how much you know do you want to save the money or you just don't have access to the money and you have to do that yourself and then in terms of the actual kind of intellectual team it's a trade-off between you know diversity and and having a, a clear sense of what you want the survey to be mm. uh, and so Perhaps we could turn to the review of the yep. election. Are you, this is concluded, right? But then... Uh... No, we, because there was a pandemic and, um, and okay. everything just... Got pushed oh, back. there was a pandemic? <laughs> <laughs> we are, this is my excuse for everything. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'll get you that book chapter next week because the pandemic... Um, we are literally in the final draft of it at the moment. So, so maybe the, you could talk a little bit about the 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 lead up to the election or whatever you are able to talk about. Um, so just by way of background, Australia had an election in, oh, when was it? 2019. May 2019. May 2019, yeah. We, we've traditionally um, had um, pretty good, pretty accurate opinion polling, right? Like, would you say? My, my opinion of accuracy is probably broader than yours. <laughs> no, it's not too bad, yeah. We've mostly done all right. And, and the biggest reason for that is probably compulsory voting. So we don't have this likely voter problem. Like anyone you sample in an opinion poll or in the election study is a voter, basically, because we have like 95% voter turnout. Um, and then in 2019, we all went into election day thinking, okay, well, we're going to have a change of government. Um, Labor was um, like a shoe in to win, right? Like everyone had sort of written their stories um, and they didn't. They, they underperformed the polls by several percentage points. Um, and it was sort of, I mean, the in, most interesting thing about it was how comprehensive the expectations were about Labour winning. Like every pollster, every newspaper had sort of written up their Sunday stories because we wrote on Saturdays, you know, their Sunday stories saying, new government. And I think some of the betting agencies had actually paid out Correct. Some of the betting agencies had paid out on labour in the days beforehand, right? Mm. Um, which is hilarious because, like, it's great to see betting agencies get screwed. Um, <laughs> this, yeah, this is how we were, right? This is like the level of expectation, and um, yeah. And then I was I was on radio on, that night, and to watch the, the faces of everyone fall through, like throughout the course of like the six hours of vote counting. Um, was hilarious because I kind of, I just find politics like a kind of a sport, right? I didn't really have any skin in the game. So it was fascinating to watch. Anyway, so um, the, the politics of this are 
interesting, like everything. Um, our polling industry is very small in Australia. It's very insular. They were very loath to um, kind of interrogate themselves or, you know, look at why this might have happened, why we had this sort of polling failure. And so the, there's a market research uh, industry association to whom some of the pollsters belong, but not all. And they announced an inquiry uh, and I'm on that committee of inquiry and the pollsters have been very reluctant to share any information, which I, I get, right? Like it's a commercial interest for them. Um, but it's really highlighted some, I think, key differences between countries in terms of how we view opinion polling, right? Here yeah. it's seen as, um, as a commercial thing. Don't ask us too many questions. We won't tell you, even if we've weighted the data, we won't tell you the sampling frame. We won't tell you response rates. Like the, the, <laughs> The level of transparency is pretty disappointing. Um, I, I think it's it's probably made us think. Well, it's made me what um, you know what role polling serves. I think mm. um, the pollsters have been very sort of quick to say, "Hey, we're just doing our best. This doesn't impact." You know, there's we don't care that there's no democratic kind of impact here, um, which I think again we as academics kind of say no. This is like a, a deeply democratic kind of thing. Like mm. this is something that's central to our understanding of politics, particularly. And it elections. feels a little feels a little bit like that Facebook argument where they're saying, oh, on the one hand, oh, we didn't have any influence, but on the other hand, uh, you better advertise with us. Um, <laughs> We just They're almost point. running this parallel. Uh, yeah. Totally right. So the reason polling is interesting because it, it loses any polling company that is engaging in, in like voter opinion polling is losing money, right, mm. on that polling. Polling doesn't make any money for polling companies, but they do it as advertisement. And I think once you know that or once you at least are conscious of that, it makes the whole exercise, well, A, much more cynical. And B, B it kind of, it, I think a lot of the incentives. And so when we think about the, you know, this, this um, phenomenon of hurting that Nate Silver talks about, and I think, you know, everyone assumes ha happens, right? That you get your data, you get your raw data in and the data say, um, you know, 40% uh, voting, you know, 40% voting intention for conservative, 45% for labor, 5%, you know, unknown or, or don't know or, or minor party. And then you do look around and you say, and like you, you know, you've collected data too, Rohan, like, you know, when you get data in, the first thing you do is eyeball it and mm. say, does this seem off? Yeah. Right. Mm. You look at gender breakdowns, you look at age breakdowns and you say, does this, does it feel right, you mm -hmm. know? And then we apply a, a post-stratification weight usually and we say, oh, well, now it's good, right? <laughs> now it must be fine. Well, what was in the weight? Oh, I don't know. Like, oh, we, ate, we weighted to age, gender, location, education benchmarks. Um, and now we've found truth, you know, which yeah. is always bullshit. Like, um, and, and so if the polling companies do herd then I don't blame them, right? It's probably what I would do. If you got a result, if everyone else is getting 40% conservative, 45% labor, and you get 35% labor and 40% conservative, mm. you wonder what the hell is wrong with that data. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I mean, we've all seen that we get some weird result. We spend 10 times the amount of time looking at that weird result than if we get something that we expected. And, and also to a certain extent, it's sensible, right? Because you sort of assume that there's some information in what they have gathered. Um, so to a certain extent, it's rational. I think it's totally rational. We, you would be very brave to release that data, right? And there's a much bigger punishment on you. And remembering that you're doing this for advertisement, mostly, right? You're doing this to convince commercial clients that if you want to know how many people 
like Mars bars, we're the people for you, right? Mm-hmm. And so to, to, to be the ones who say everyone else is wrong, right? We're the renegades here, but we're the right renegades. It's crazy brave, you know? Mm. So and particularly think, when the market is so small, there's just no point in putting your head out there like that, right? And so the size of the market in Australia, I think, has, has really Does. contributed to that. Yeah. And they can collude. So they've, they've all basically shut down and said, no, I'm not going to release my waiting information and they're not going to release their waiting information. And so they can all not release their waiting information. And, and there's no, you know, they, they just bunker down together and we can't get in at them. Mm. And so we're going to make that criticism, right? That the lack of transparency is a massive problem. Um, but I think it will just reflect back off their little bunker. Yeah. And the other thing is, you know, we've got a, a journalist colleague with us at ANU and, and he says, oh, this is all well and good, Jill. But he said, any time I get a poll, I can write five stories immediately. Yeah. And so I, oh, the media we, we don't want to go too, we don't want to go too inside the baseball, but it has Sorry. been sort of interesting <laughs> having him there. Um, he runs a weekly podcast. Um, and so it has been interesting having him there from for, for that sort of perspective. Um, the reality of like what's going on in the media. They're happy. They're happy with polls, whether they're good or not. Right. Because it's just, it's easy content for them. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. So, right? <laughs> I think we're too cynical, but I, <laughs> Hopefully, oh, Sam well, can be. I've got a student working on a project, looking at this at the moment, and he's found, and I shouldn't sort of foreshadow his findings, but he he's, he finds that in the US context, there's no relationship between um, past accuracy of opinion polls and how much coverage or the sort of tone of the coverage now. So wow. the famous example in the US is the Rasmussen poll, right? That's just constantly rubbish. Mm-hmm. And it still gets relatively like positive reporting mm. and so this so is an argument right for poll of polls where you can sort of have some sort of um, effect um and in their history and things like that yeah it, i think what all the poll aggregation has done has show those it's really revealed those outliers right mm. um but on the other hand it makes it then it makes it less kind of it disincentivizes being the the accurate outlier too right Right. if you can sit in that if you can sit inside the standard error in a poll aggregation model then you're gold (laughs) you don't want to be the one who's always outside the standard error i know you'll be disgusted right but but when you think about the commercial incentives that makes perfect sense Mm -hmm. yeah i'm inaccurate but so is the whole band (laughs) so do you see like surveys and things changing i mean so we've got facebook google i mean they all know everything about us um, we're so screwed well, i'm in the dumbest <laughs> industry right why am i doing this <laughs> people have stopped responding to surveys like what are we going to do um no because i'm old-fashioned and i think we can i think there's something sort of fundamental about asking people what they think about this um, i think people also enjoy like BuzzFeed quizzes are popular for a right? reason. I yeah. got sampled more. Like, yeah. Um, I, I tweet I about it every so. time I get sampled. I'm so excited. <laughs> All right, we're such dorks. We're not um, normal. <laughs> no, we're not normal. And this is what you have to keep telling and the this students. This is the point. <laughs> we're not normal. As we were explaining to Sam earlier, um, I live and, and where Rohan did his PhD is in the equivalent of Ottawa. And we're so not normal, right? <laughs> like we are just odd. Um, I the future of surveys. I I think Facebook and Google and, and all of this, um, as long as they're proprietary, and which they are so far, right? I mean, unless there's some great push towards making a lot of this information publicly available. And there's not because of the identifiability thing. As long as we're still in any way worried about privacy, and we're probably not worried about privacy as much as we should be, but um, as long as there's, as long as privacy is even a sort of inkling of an issue, then 
I think surveys are okay. Do we have to change the way we sample? Absolutely. Like, like incentives have been, you know, like a monumental shift for us, but they're pretty, that's a pretty small change in the scheme of things. Um, Address-based sampling probably still has a future, you know, where we can just send letters to people. Um, phone, I mean, any kind of phone sampling, whether it's um, mobile, landline, dual frame, um, any kind of random digit dialing, I think, is dead. It's, de it's dead, right? Do you answer your phone if you don't know the number? I don't. No. 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 And so I don't think anyone under the age of 40 does. And, and mobiles are hard. Too many of us have been burnt with calling underage people. That sounds awful. Um, but survey companies are, are, are pretty nervous about mobile, like, about mobile um, sampling frames because of that. Because you, you can be harassing teenagers. There's, there are commercial operators now here and probably in Canada as well who are um, offering like ge um, geography-based mobile lists. So they have somehow, I think from the, must be from the phone like providers, um, you know, the like phone, telephone networks, um, you know, state-based or province-based lists of, of mobile phone numbers. I, I just think when people aren't respond, people aren't answering, then none of this stuff really matters, right? Mm. Yeah, we've had some good experiences with like SMS based, um, you know, short surveys or at least SMS um, kind of uh, like not recruitment, but you know, advance notice. Yeah, mm -hmm. like we're going to call you in a day. Here's what it's about. But it's, it's I don't think there's much future in it. Mm. So are there any uh, like avenues or realms that or projects that you have coming up that you're act that you're very excited about or you think are potentially just up and coming? Um so after saying all of this, after <laughs> you know, after you know, telling you guys for an hour how important probability based samples are, most of what I do is non probability based stuff, right? It's survey <laughs> experiments. And certainly academically that's what everyone is doing, right? Survey-based okay. experiments. Um, giving people different treatments, you know, um, giving them, you know, randomly assigned vignettes or randomly assigned um, hypothetical candidates, this sort of thing. Everyone's doing that. I, I'm not massively excited about it. I mean, they have a massive external validity problem. Um, yeah. The difference between asking, you know, would you vote for Rohan or Sam? Um, you know, but actually seeing you both, you know, on a, on a ballot paper is very different. Yeah. And I think I worry that we're getting away from the fact that voting is actually really important. You know, like when we vote, we don't just go, oh, fuck, I don't know, Sam, right? <laughs> like we actually make, like, maybe again, maybe I'm odd, but it's, it's a big thing to vote. Yeah, no, people um, think about it. People talk about it. Even if you're uh, low stakes, like you're, you probably decided on the spur of the moment, you definitely didn't decide the moment you checked it, the box. So there's always, this is something that always comes up in election studies. Where there's always like a, a sort of 10% or 15% of voters who say, I've decided on the day. Mm -hmm. And I can maybe see that in a compulsory system where you turn, where you go, oh, shit, Saturday, I have to go vote or else I'm going to get fined $20. I can maybe see that those people exist. But how do they exist in a voluntary system? Who in Canada is waking up on election day saying, I don't know who I'll vote. I will vote. I'll definitely vote, but I don't know who I'll vote for. So I don't think people lie so much, but I think a lot of us tell ourselves Oh, my vote's up for grabs. You know, I could. We I'm like to think of ourselves, so, yeah. Right. I think I tell myself I'm a swinging voter, and I absolutely am not. Like, yeah, same. Yeah. And so I might say in a survey, "Yeah, I decided on the day," but did I really? Like, <laughs> yeah, that's also an issue with like qualitative studies in general, right? You don't. People will. I don't think there's a way of getting at that, right? Yeah. yeah. People are always going to. It's it's motivated reasoning. It's not lying. 
It's, it's what, the, what we tell ourselves. I'm very open-minded. I would never be a partisan hack. <laughs> Most of us are, right? Most of us are. We just don't, uh, we just don't want to reveal it to ourselves. <laughs> So, uh, do you have advice for the for the kids? For <laughs> the kids, what are some the adults or kids? <laughs> the students what what are some of the things that they should? Um, I mean, what should they if they want to go into surveys more? Yeah, I know it's scary. <laughs> uh, um, I, I guess my advice is that you know you can have all of the oh God, don't adopt rescue dogs. <laughs> um, they're a nightmare. Um, I think you can have all of the, the, the stratification, you know, the, the sort of post stratification techniques in the world, but you've got to understand your data in terms of, you know, what to go into if you're, you know, once you're graduated in stats, privacy stuff is going to be so important. Right. So I, I mentioned like statistical disclosure limitation, which is, um, which is how we decide as survey researchers, what, what level of information we can um, we can release publicly and there's a big emphasis on like open science and open access data and all this stuff. But the flip side of that is, you know, that we're releasing all this identifiable data, um, things around, yeah, re-identify, re, re identification, um, particularly as a lot more administrative data gets released, governments are going to be very nervous about this. Nick, Nick, come here. Um, that's going to be a huge issue. It's already come out in Australia where um, government agencies have been sharing data and the minute anything gets leaked, it's, you know, it's very easy to, to identify individuals. That's grim. But there's money in it. <laughs> well, I think that's all our questions. So thank you very much. And thank you to your dogs for cameoing in this video. <laughs> We call that his chicken noise. Just <laughs> like balk, like just balks at things. Sorry. <laughs> no need to apologize. And then Rohan was gonna sledge me about the sixes, but I think Yeah. You know. Yeah, no, no, thank you. Thank you. Um thank you, Jill. Uh <laughs> Jill is actually a massive seventy sixes fan. Uh, so we've arranged a print of the moment that Kawhi's how many times oh, have it on the reel? Four oh, bounces. Four bounces. Four bounces. Uh, so we'll pop that in the mail. Remember, oh, 